Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. This is a makeup lecture, winter 2017, week number 10. I was sick. I still am not feeling the greatest, but I'm going to try to get through this best I can. At least some of this stuff uh, is familiar to you. We're going to talk about disc herniations and spinal stenosis. We're not going to get to tumors of the spine though. All right, here we go. So start with a case here. What's the diagnosis? A 34-year-old man enters the office with moderate low back pain, 510, which occurred following a rugby match one week ago. Neurological examination is normal. Uh, patient has decreased flexion extension, uh, lateral flexion, so he's stiff. Uh, some muscle spasm is noted, tender to the touch. Radiographs are taken. What do you see? You can pause it so I don't have to wait. I don't see anything. I see a very slight, that's not even a scoliosis, that's under 10 degrees. It's just a little uh, asymmetry of the spine. Don't see any fractures. Everything looks good. There's the pars right here. Don't forget to always check that pars for lucencies through it. Right? Supri a surprising number of you missed this on the OSCE. Uh, test. There was a huge fracture, lucency right through here, so don't miss any parse fractures. Everything looks good though. A little bit of anterior weight bearing, but otherwise uh, not too bad. For those of you who don't believe me, that's a scoliosis. I drew some lines for you. It's four degrees. That's not a scoliosis. So lumbago, terrible. Uh, don't I don't like that word lumbago. That means you don't know what the diagnosis is. And if you don't know what's wrong with a patient, why they have back pain, you certainly shouldn't be treating them. So based on the history, an acute traumatic sprain strain with associated muscle spasm, spasm a little antalgic listing, and some bio biomechanical abnormalities, such as spinal, well, specifically spinal asymmetry and a little anterior uh, weight bearing. So that is a good uh, scientific smart diagnosis. Another one, a 12-year-old female developed chronic low back pain over the last year, which is now strong enough to preclude her from sport. So that's a serious problem. Kids, you gotta, they, they have to really be hurt to stop sports. There's no specific incident of injury, just kind of got sore after practice, got worse and worse. Neurological examination was fine. There was significant reduction in left lateral flexion with pain on end range. You take some x-rays. What's the diagnosis? <clears throat> well, it's a congenital scoliosis, right? There's a hemivertebra, semi-segmented, the disc space here, right? It's, it's bonded to the, uh, looks like the L3, there's 12. We've got a missing rib there, some, some funkiness. One, two, so it's a supernumerary hemivertebra, semi-segmented. Maybe a little wedge there as well. So chronic lumbar sprain strain with associated congenital scoliosis, paravertebral muscle spasm, imaging findings, supernumerary semi-segmented hemivertebra, complete sacralization, agenesis of the 12th rib. Another one. 48-year-old police sergeant, true case here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm not going to have time to edit these coughs out of this. I apologize in advance. 48-year-old um, police sergeant come, has uh, chronic low back pain but tolerable. His primary complaint is, is he can't walk. It's bilateral leg pain, thigh pain, uh, numbness, weakness, heaviness. He sits down and stops, bends forward, the pain goes away. You should know what the diagnosis is already. Now he can then go another 10 or 15 minutes and the same thing happens. Neurological examination is normal. Uh, extension and tolerance, what's that mean? Anything that goes backwards, he can't do. It hurts. It hurts his back and it could even reproduce symptoms in his legs, like a Kemp's test, or just pure extension backwards. Here's his MRI. What do we got? Okay. 
Okay, I tried to mute out my cough, so hopefully that worked. What do we got? So this is an axial view of L3. T2 weighted. Where's, look at the spinal, the thecal sacs, nothing. Severe ligamentum flavum thickening. Groucho Marx eyebrows are super thick. Lateral recesses aren't bad though, right? So it's just pure central stenosis. Uh, and it smashed the cord down to nothing. So we've we've talked about that before. Chronic low back pain, neurogenic intermittent cloud creation associated with central stenosis, unilateral degenerative spinal anesthesis. The image findings, ligamentum flavor thickening, everything I just said. There's a little concentric tear as well. See it over here? There's a well, not so little, right? It's a pretty good size one. It seems that you know, anecdotally, I've seen this in my practice that it's when they're back here they seem to be more symptomatic. They seem to be more asymptomatic because these can be seen in the normal population as well. And there might even be a little slip here, uh, although it's hard to see. The facets, we have those ram horn facets, so it's definitely degenerated, degenerated facets. So let's talk about stenosis here. We haven't really officially talked about this. Uh, there's two types of stenosis. There's a central stenosis and a lateral stenosis. Let's start with the central stenosis. It's a condition which occurs when the sagittal diameter of lumbar vertebrae narrows to less than 12 millimeters. You need to know these numbers. 12 millimeters, so that's on a sagittal view from the side. It has to be an MRI or CT. Or the overhead or the axial view of the thecal sac narrows to less than 10 millimeters. You need to know these two numbers. It's best diagnosed on MRI. Here's another uh, client of mine. You can see this, they didn't make a cut down the plane of the disc, right? My pet peeve, because this is all bone, this is disc. But we have a bulging disc here. We have ligamentum flavum thickening. Poor thecal sac is just pinched right in the middle at L4. You can even see the black zone right here. So are these nerve roots being bathed by cerebral spinal fluid? Not very good, especially when the patient's walking or standing, which increases extension. Or if they're doing McKinsey exercises, which they should never do uh, with stenosis. Not quite as bad here, but whenever the nerve roots show up like that, that's bad news. <clears throat> so remember, this should be 10, anything less than 10. It should be 13, 14 millimeters. Uh, this, this is an axial uh, diameter here. Uh, it's 6.74 millimeters, so this is severe central stenosis. Lateral recesses are here. Those are still pretty open. There's a disc bulging. Everything I said. Let's go to the next one. So its presence now, be careful with this. Just because you see it, it doesn't always mean it's there. Even if it's at all five levels, it can be asymptomatic. Uh, if it's at one level, it usually is not the cause in and of itself of leg pain. It's got to be at least two levels. Uh, three levels is, increases the chances of it being there. Uh, and the classic, like our example of the police sergeant, the classic problem is NIC, uh, neurogenic intermittent claudication, or you could say NIC, intermittent neurogenic claudication. I like to say NIC, like a NIC card for a computer. And most of the research uses NIC. So uh, here's another one. This is Phil C., 61-year-old male has had increased low back pain with a decreased ability to be on his work at feet. It's another true story. Uh, he's a physical therapist, uh, winding down his career. He had to give up running many years ago and has now has difficulty walking more than a half mile because of the onset of bilateral uh, thigh pain, weakness, and burning. We already know what it is. Neurological evaluation is normal. Why would it be normal? If he's got leg pain, well, because it's a transient leg pain. It only comes in, uh, we'll, we'll see what causes it in a minute, but it only comes on with walking and being on his feet and, and anything that decreases and squishes the thecal sac. So it hasn't progressed to the point where it's uh, damaging yet. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? Neurological evaluation is normal. Here's the MRI. Oh, this is a recent case here. Yeah, this is a mid-sagittal cut. What else does he? He's got a whole bunch of stuff. Boy, I could use this one on the test, couldn't I? Let's start naming some of the stuff. Well, first of all, he's got this curly Q sign, I call it, where the 
uh, the fecal sac is so squished here, uh, it actually gets dark because no cerebral spinal fluid is visible. And then it gets all curly. These roots start to get curly. Uh, this is a classic sign of central stenosis. Uh, he's also got, what are these? Schmorl's nodes. He's got, what's this in plate color? It happened to be black on T2, on T1 waiting. So that's type 1 modic changes. And then what it's, what's it called when you have a combination? A rat looks like it's chewed up all these in plates. Got a dark disc, degenerative disc disease, disc height loss, modic change. Isolated disc reabsorption, probably one of the most feared diagnoses there are. They don't respond well to to anything. So I think we talked about that before. <clears throat> I drew some lines on here. Again, this is mid-sagittal cut. So this, this should be 20, right? A normal central canal in a sagittal view should be 20 millimeters. Look at it. Terrible. Anything less than 12 is official stenosis. So he's got stenosis at all levels except L5. So not a good thing here. Everything I just said, isolated disc reabsorption. There you go. Some fun facts, always like these, fun for me making tests on. Most common reason for spine surgery now is central stenosis in patients over 65. This is increasing like crazy as the baby boomers are getting older. 64 million senior, senior citizens are expected to become disabled, secondary to central stenosis over the next decade. Tons of resources or references on that one. Uh, it's a fear condition because conservative care has a terrible track record at fixing this. Your atlas adjustment is not going to work. Uh, maybe strengthening the core, uh, checking the facet joints to making sure uh, everything is as movable as possible. There are no fits, facet joint fixations. Maybe some traction if he can tolerate it. Uh, and then swimming, keep, just keep your fingers crossed. Keep them as, act, as active as possible and keep your fingers crossed. In a recent study, almost 25%, 21%, almost a quarter of patients who were just diagnosed with spinal stenosis, they failed conservative care within three years and necessitated a decompression surgery. So you're, gonna, you're not going to do great with these patients. That doesn't mean we can't try, though, and we should try, to, because our goal uh, as primary health care provider is, is to prevent surgery. So we try everything we can. What causes central stenosis? <clears throat> the big four, ligamentum flavum thickening, Remember, that's the ligament that holds the roof of the posterior arch together. It's a yellow ligament. It's got a lot of elastic fiber in it. It gets thick. We don't know why it gets thick in some people. I've seen 20-year-olds with it already causing stenosis. So very strange. Uh, disc space collapse. This is very important when you look at an x-ray, especially on OSCE tests, uh, board, state board tests. If you see a segment that's collapsed bone on bone, the ligamentum flavum will buckle. Remember, it's a tough, fibrous ligament, but, but it's stretchy. Uh, so if, if you take all the slack out of it, it's got to do something. A lot of times it'll buckle forward and cause uh, central stenosis. Degenerative spondylolisthesis. Uh, remember, that's a slip of the facets. The superior articular process goes right forward and jams in uh, to the the space between the lateral recess and the central canal. So, and remember, an ismic spondylolisthesis actually increases the, the, the um, diameter of the vertebral canal. It does not cause, uh, typically cause ismic spondylolisthesis. You can get a beak that shish kebabs a nerve, but you're not going to get a beak on both sides. So only degenerative spondylolisthesis causes stenosis. And then the old bulging disc, we've already seen an example of that. So these four are almost always in combination, or at least a couple of them are. A large paracentral herniation can do it. Facet joint hypertrophy uh, can compound the problem, but this causes more lateral stenosis because now we're in the lateral recess and distal, like the intervertebral frame, it's anything out is lateral stenosis. Uh, we're not even going to talk about lateral stenosis that much because all it is is compression of the lateral recess uh, or the IVF itself. And that really doesn't happen too much in the lumbar spine. It's almost uh, typically, it's more typically the central canal.
I mean, I guess it can happen. Well, it, d it does happen too. But I, I find it to be more unilateral than bilateral. Then you can have facet cysts. We talk about those. Uh, congenitally short pedicles. That happens a lot of times where pedicles aren't as long. If the pedicles are the shorter the pedicles are, the shorter uh, the the sag or the axial diameter of the vertebral canal is. There's another patient, very young patient. Look at these beautiful discs. I think this guy was in his late twenties, if I remember right, and uh, he's already borderline canal stenosis. So not a good thing. Central and again, twenty measure, twenty millimeters. These should be any measure under twelve. Some researchers say under thirteen, but we'll say twelve is stenosis. Neurologic, uh, neurogenic intermittent nick, neurogenic intermittent claudication. It's the very very common symptom associated with central stenosis. Uh, AK is lumbar spinal stenosis syndrome typically presents as a bilateral radicular pain which does not go below the knees. It can, that's not, the, the specificity of that finding isn't the greatest, but typically it stays in the butt and thighs. The character of the pain is a tiredness, a loss of power, feeling of numbness in the lower extremities. It's not typically an, an electric-like pain associated with varying degrees of low back pain. Patient typically does have some low back pain with this. Symptoms: no uh, anything that extends the spine, like walking, increases extension. Standing still increases extension. These will all bring out the symptoms. You don't know how many clients I talk to are not getting better. They're not recovering from their stenosis, and I find out that their therapist or their chiropractor has him doing McKinsey extension. That's crazy. That There's no question. There's tons of research that narrows the canal and it increases the pressure within the cerebrospinal fluid and within the nerve root. So don't do any type of extension exercises. Everything I just said right there. And it tends to buckle ligamentum flavum, which jams right into the nerve roots and worsens the situation. Uh, let's see. Just some more research here, uh, some results of some research studies. Single symptom alone is kind of hard to, to prognosticate or make the diagnosis. It's better when they have a, uh, several symptoms together, like leg pains with walking, uh, which goes away with sitting down. Much stronger diagnosis than just leg pain and walking. Uh, such symptoms include... Uh, so these are all the big ones here. A positive shopping cart sign. We've talked about this. Go to Costco and look, you'll see old people bent over the grocery carts moving around. That increases, that decreases the pressure uh, of the cerebrospinal fluid and within the nerve roots, and it opens up the stenotic vertebral canal is why they do that. Uh, walking and standing symptoms, or walking or standing cause symptoms, uh, which are relieved by sitting that's a huge one right there. Not by standing. If they walk and the pain hurts, it causes the pain, and then they stop walking and stand still, if the pain is relieved, that's not good. That's that's neuro, that's vascular claudication, vascular intermittent claudication, which we'll talk about in a minute. Make sure you know the difference. Claudication pain is located above the knees. These are all for neck uh, and positive sharp and cart sign. Differential diagnosis, vascular intermittent claudication. Let's remember what that's from. Atherosclerosis. Here's a reconstruction, uh, 3D, uh, a CT reconstruction of the abdominal aorta and the common iliac arteries. And you can see these fill defects all over the place. So this is just fill. The common iliacs are filled with atherosclerotic plaques so bad that they're uh, they're causing this patient to have vascular claudication. What's the difference? Patient does not have to sit down and bend forward after walking to get relief. All they got to do is stop walking, stand still, uh, and it does the trick. Then it lets enough blood trickle through the muscles, calm down 
Uh, and remember when you're walking, the muscles are exercising and they need more oxygen. Oxygen comes from the blood. They can't get the oxygen. They can't get the blood because of this narrowing. But if they stand still, relax the muscles, the demand decreases and slowly they'll catch up uh, and the muscles will get their oxygen. And let's see, patient symptoms are not a great way for making a diagnosis of vascular or neurogenic claudication. That's again by themselves, it's a combination that you, that you need to make a better diagnosis. Uh, some more kind of fun facts here. Symptoms relieved by standing. And number two, symptoms that course below the knees uh, during walking are most strongly associated with vascular. So if they have those two things, if they walk and the pain starts and they stop walking and it gets better. And when they walk, when the pain is there, it goes past the knees all the way to the feet. That's pr pretty sure that they have vascular intermittent claudication. Here's some more things. Uh, if the patient is able to stand for a long time without suffering lower extremity pain, then he doesn't have. So here's a single test you can do. Uh, and a uh, 2013 paper had a, sen a sensitivity of 97%, le negative likelihood ratio of 0.05. Those are pretty good numbers, right? So if you just have the patient stand up, and they don't suffer lower extremity pain just from standing there. They probably don't have neurogenic claudication. Patients with gastrocnemius pain or calf pain following walking, which is relieved by standing without, they don't have to sit, just standing, again, strongly indicates vascular intermittent claudication. Uh, look at that positive likelihood ratio, 20. Uh, so, and remember that this is a positive finding, right? So that the, the positive finding is they get relief uh, by standing. That's positive. Uh, so that tells us specificity. Positive findings and specificity go together. Remember this? Oh no, it's back. It's back on the final. So remember, we always use sensitivity or a negative likelihood ratio when a patient has a negative test result. Right, snout and spin. So go review the first lecture if, because those will be back again. You gotta, you gotta know what to do when a patient brings you a, a positive test for cancer in, and you look up the sensitivity and specificity of that test to know how worried everybody should be. Uh, let's see, best single symptom pr predictors again. This is down the same lines we're talking. If the patient is able to walk for a long time without the development of lower extremity pain, if he can walk a mile or two miles, uh, he doesn't have vascular claudication. Sensitivity, uh, uh, sensitivity, right? Because there's no positive finding. He just walks and walks and walks, and there's no positive finding. So it's a negative finding for the long walk test. Negative goes with sensitivity. So 96% sensitivity. Notice how the negative finding matches sensitivity again. Some people have still have trouble with that. If walking pain disappears with standing still, then there's moderate evidence to suggest the patient has vascular claudication. Likelihood ratio of close to 10, 7.8. So it's still pretty good. Treatment, so what do you do for treatment for these things? Conservative care, avoid extension, no McKinsey exercises again. So if conservative care fails, then there's surgical options. There's uh, interspinous distraction devices, which are the same as interspinous space. I need to take that out. They're the same as interspinous spaces. And then there's surgical decompression. Conservative care, unfortunately, has a really poor track record when combating true central stenosis. Why would this be? Because central stenosis typically is the result of a degenerative process, and we can't reverse a degenerative process. Maybe our spinal manipulations and stretching and muscle work and exercise, maybe it can slow down, or maybe it can halt the degenerative process. There's no evidence for this, but it makes sense uh, to me. It's not going to ever reverse. I don't care what you read on YouTube or what you see. You're not going to reverse uh, someone's central stenosis with magical physical therapy treatments or chiropractic treatments or magnets or whatever out there. It doesn't work. There's no research to support that claim. And anecdotally, it's just ridiculous in my opinion. 
Okay, I'm getting off track already. We're only on slide 38. The gold standard treatment for central stenosis, that is, what's that word? You might see that on your test, refractory. Refractory to conservative care. What does that mean? It means it didn't work. It's resistant to conservative care like your chiropractic care, your physical therapy care, your acupuncture. So when, when conservative care doesn't work, the gold standard is surgical quote, decompression. And that's, now remember, their pain has to be intolerable. Their ODI, their osteoarthritis disability in their necks needs to be over 50. So surgical decompression. What in the world is decompression? We've talked about it, but now let's officially talk about it so I can test you on it. It's a more general word, and it means simply two things. It could mean, no, it means three things. It typically means a laminotomy, where they go in, remove ligamentum flavum, because that usually gets big, and then they trim away some of the lamina uh, to increase the wiggle room of the thecal sac or to increase the diameters of the, of the vertebral canal. Now, if it's more severe, if it's lateral stenosis, then they're going to have to go out in the foramen uh, and shave down the superior articular process, which is the posterior wall of the foramen, right? So that's called a foraminotomy. So oftentimes they'll do a laminotomy, uh, foraminotomy. Laminectomy means they take ectomy means they take all the bone out of the lamina. Foraminotomy, they're just going to shave some of it down. I'm sorry, laminotomy means they're going to shave some of the lamina down without taking it all. And discectomy is they'll take a disc herniation that's uh, compounding the problem. That's a decompression. There's a nice cartoon of one. So the patient's laying face down, uh, L4, L5 spinous processes. You can picture, you know, their butt is right here, the gluteus maximus muscles. So if you cut that open, you scrape all the tissue away, uh, all the fat, multifidae muscles. Here's the normal side. Here's the lamina, spinous process, uh, inferior articular process, superior articular process. Here's the lamina below. And here is a laminotomy where they have taken a chunk out of this lamina. And if they have to keep it going over here further uh, and take the superior and arti inferior articular process out, that's called a foraminotomy. So it's as simple as that. You can see the traversing nerve root right there. Ec or I'm sorry, that would be the exiting nerve root. Traversing nerve root would still be hiding inside the thecal sac here. Surgery versus conservative care. Let's, you know, don't take my word for it. Let's, let's put some studies up here. The Weinstein, very famous sports study, got a lot of information. 2010 study reports the results of a multi-center, so it wasn't done at one center. It was done by different centers throughout the country, which is good. It pitted surgery, laminotomy, uh, against conservative care for the treatment of central stenosis. All patients in the study had neurogenic intermittent claudication and stenosis confirmed by imaging. It was a big study. It's over 600 patients, 645 patients. Uh, so over 320, what, 322 in each group. They're pretty equal, the groups. And the conservative care before surgery consisted of chiropractic and physical therapy. Mostly uh, physical therapy, chiropractic was 28% of the patients had that. 60% had physical therapy. 55% uh, had medication, epidural steroids, so a little bit of opioids in there. The run-of-the-mill conservative care, no acupuncture. Uh, oper the operative treatment was a classic posture decompression where they only did laminotomy. If, if they had to do a foraminotomy, cases were thrown out because that decreases the chance of success. After treatment, patients were followed for four years, which is a really long time. Anything over two years is great. Four years is fantastic. Here's the results. Patients who had the decompression were much better than the patients who only were treated in that four years with conservative care. Uh, 0 0.05 uh, is, uh, I forget what the exact number was. It was down there pretty low. Uh, so there was no question uh, that the patients were much more happy. They had better Oswestry scores. Uh, they had less pain on the numeric rating scale, which we used to call the VAS scale. Uh, and they had, most importantly, this stuff is all well and good, but when you just ask the patient how satisfied they were, they were much more satisfied, statistically significantly more satisfied than the patients who only had conservative care. 
COVAX study, same thing. Surgery versus conservative care, big study. Uh, now this was a this was a meta-analysis where they pooled data from high, very high quality randomized controlled trials, came up with 739 patients between them. All studies had a minimum follow-up of two years. So plenty of, uh, plenty of study time. Uh, pa again, patients who had surgery, much better than the patients who had conservative care. Same, same thing as the last one. Okay, case study. Let's change it up here. 65-year-old male enters your complaint, complaint of chronic back pain, in, inability to walk more than a quarter mile without complaints of bilateral low extremity pain and cramping. History of recent spine surgery, which failed uh, to ameliorate his complaints. There's another vocabulary word for you, ameliorate. What's that mean? Fails to get him better. The treatment didn't ameliorate, it didn't relieve his pain. He has extension tolerance, decreased flexion, and extension lumbar spine. Sounds like stenosis, doesn't it? Fluoroscopic images uh, on his cell phone. So he brings in these images on his cell phone. What has happened here? What? Did he get shot with a bullet? Look at that. Will I get some water? <clears throat> okay, I hear you. Good. I hear some of you saying it. That's an interspinous spacer device. Uh, the most common one out there is the, or well, used to be, the X-Stop. Oh no, rabbit hole. Interspinous spacers. There's a Coflex device, which is popular as well. Interspinous spacers, dynamic interspinous spacers, X-Stop. Uh, they're purportedly, not a vocabulary word, purportedly, that means supposedly, for the treatment of degenerative disc disease, central lateral stenosis, is in red with a star, disc herniation facet syndrome. Now, the manufacturers are claiming all this stuff. In the real world, no one, uh, in my opinion, in the right mind, would ever use this for anything except central and lateral stenosis. And I don't recommend this, by the way because the rate of reoperation is ridiculous with it. Um, but there's no the trouble with it is, remember the columns of the spine that where the disc is, that's the anterior column, and then the posterior columns are where uh, the actual load would pass through the facet joints. It'll stabilize the posterior columns, but it will not stabilize the anterior column because there's nothing, it's not an inner body fusion. So therefore, it's not going to work uh, the research does not support its use for discogenic pain uh, or for disc herniation or for facet syndrome. Again, in my opinion and according to the research. Withstanding, uh, notwithstanding manufacturer claims, it's almost never used for the treatment. It's almost always used for the treatment of central and lateral stenosis. That I'll buy. And there's tons of research on this. But you'll see why I don't like it in a minute. Well, I already told you why I don't like it. Metal device is placed between the adjacent spine and its process motion segment, and this spacer creates a slight flexion deformity, so it jacks up uh, the posture of the motion segment, and it increases the, the sagittal canal uh, diameter, uh, as well as the anterior or the axial canal diameter. Uh, it stabilizes the anterior, according to the manufacturers, what I say, that's bull, BS. But it does stabilize somewhat the posterior columns. Oops. Uh, it increases the diameter of the lateral recess and neural foramen. There's a picture of Coflex, another Coflex device. You see how it just, see the gap in the facets there? It just jacks these bones up. So if you're all filled with stenosis here, it gives you a little more wiggle room. I don't know how the facets are going to like that stress and strain, though. Let's see what the research says. So let's see. This is the Wu study. Oh, I think I have this written out. 2014 study, meta-analysis, right? That's the highest quality of evidence. They pooled 400 over 400 patients. And that these tests pitted interspinous spacers against the gold standard decompression for the treatment of spinal stenosis. Uh, the ISS theory, ISS increases, well, we know that already, the IVF size, we said that. And then it, by fusing, by putting the spacer in there, 
it stops any irritating micro motion of the facets. So if you have these bones locked together, now they don't fuse, they don't do any grinding or don't put any uh, bone paste in here. It's just this device, but it's supposed to hold these pretty still. I'm not sure if it's going to hold these 100% sturdy. And it's certainly not going to stop uh, motion within the disc. And that motion is thought to be the irritator, right? Uh, so anyway, so what did they find in this big study? Uh, there's actually, with regard to outcomes, there was no difference. So this was just as effective at, at taking away the patient's back pain and neurogenic claudication. Uh, but, here's the big, and it's a big but, every study I've looked at, there is a significant, way more than uh, 0 .0, uh, 0.05, uh, revision surgeries. These darn things break. The spinuses break. All sorts of stuff goes wrong with them and they have to come in for another surgery. Um, so that's the problem. Two significantly more revision surgeries. Uh, 2014 study. Here's the FAM study. 2016. Uh, same thing. The rate of revision surgery. Uh, same thing. They compared, they compared decompression against the interspinous spacer device. The rate of revision surgery was way higher uh, in the patients with these interspinous devices. And revision surgery means they had to come back in maybe two weeks later, maybe two months, maybe two years later. They had to come back in for another costly surgery and disability period. Look at the p-value, 0. 0.000001. So there's no way, I mean, that's there's no way that's, that's just freak luck. Uh, there's no question that if you do one of these X stops, your chances are way higher that you will be back in the operating room in the near future. There's another, I'm not even sure which one that is. There's another type of interspinous device. There's all, people are jumping on these things. I see all sorts of new ones. They're, they're trying to get patents and tweaking the designs on these. They all work the same way and they're all gonna break and in my opinion, they're all, uh, they're no good. Just go for the simple decompression uh, until the research starts proving that one of these things works. And so far that hasn't happened. Pathogenicity of Cauticoinus syndrome. So, well, this isn't too hard, I don't think, but let's do a quick anatomy review here. Uh, so the th remember the thecal sac is different. The lumbar spine has no spinal cord, right? Does the lumbar spine have a spinal cord? No, cervical and thoracic do. That's that solid uh, mass of uh, gray and white matter. Uh, but the lumbar spine doesn't. Maybe L1 does, but that's about it. Remember, the spinal cord stops at about the level of between L1 and L2 as the conus medullaris. And then, well, how does it? How do the nerve roots get down to the coccyx? They just hang in a continuation of the dural sac, uh, and they hang in a giant subarachnoid space, and that's affectionately called the thecal sac. And these are not embedded in the substance of the spinal cord, the nerve roots. They just hang in this huge uh, subarachnoid space. It's called the thecal sac. Uh, they do, one advantage is they get some extra nourishment by cerebral spinal fluid unless the patient's stenotic. There's a really nice picture. Uh, so here's the conus medullaris. Remember the L5 and S1 segments are up here at the T12 level. And the nerve roots come out and they're super, super long nerve roots. S1 goes all the way down here. Right? So this is looks like a horse's tail. That's called the thecal, that's called the cauticoina. And it's surrounded by, here's a better picture. It's surrounded by the sac of dura, which is that goes all the way up to the foramen magnum, right? There's a thecal sac all the way up, but it's really tight. It's only this wide as you go up. But down here, it's huge, huge, uh, the subarachnoid space. Uh, and you can see the nerve rootlets coming off here, forming the nerve roots which hang. And remember, they, they kind of have a party and hang out and have a good time. But when it's their time to come out, they bud off the th thecal sac. They poke right through it. They take the dura with them uh, as they go. Here is a real picture of a very fresh cadaver, I should add. Uh, this is L4 region. So we're looking P to A, 
pedicles are cut, the posterior arch is removed, uh, and we can see the nerve roots hanging out. So this is the cauda equina hanging out, doing their job. But when it's time for them to do their job, they poke out of the thecal sac. So this one is budding right here. So it's poking right out and right at this point, right under the pedicle, it's free and clear of the thecal sac. Takes a little cerebral spinal fluid with it. There's the dorsal root ganglia. The IVF would be right here. Here's the other one cut down here. So nice image. Uh, remember the nerve roots are made up of, you know, it's this nerve root right here has got components within it. It's got sensory fiber within it. It's got motor fiber within it. It's got proprioceptive fiber within it. And it's got nociceptive fiber within it. It's got pain fibers as well. And not only that, it's got its own radicular artery. There's a proximal and distal radicular artery uh, that runs all the way up to the thecal sac here. And there's a vein in there as well. And that's actually very important uh, to the, the mechanism that we believe causes neurogenic claudication. And here's a real picture uh, of these, these radicular arteries. There's a distal radicular artery. The blood flow is actually going this way. Proximal radicular artery is coming here. Whoops, that's coming right here. That's the vein up there. And they injected this with dye so it's not purple. Uh, and they meet together in a, what's called a watershed area. So it's almost like a capillary anastomosis. And then we have the radicular vein going in one direction down here. The radicular veins dump into the epidural venous plexus which is very important. We need to refresh your anatomy on that. The nerve root, uh, the nerve root vein, the nerve root veins drain into the epidural venous plexus, which surrounds the thecal sac. It's very important. It's more prominent on the roof and floor of the vertebral canal. Here's a nice cartoon of this. Uh, so here's the cauda equina. Here's all the nerve roots. Uh, it shows you there's the dura mater. Uh, there's the arachnoid mater, there's a potential space, which is usually never there. But then there's subarachnoid space, is all the space in between the nerve roots. Where's the pia mater? Pia mater is around each nerve root itself. And then on the inside, uh, on the just underneath the arachnoid mater, is the epidural venous plexus. Here's just a little ghost of it uh, in this drawing. You can see how this nerve root is budding uh, off right here kind of cool drawing. Here's another uh, not so cool one maybe, but it shows you a lateral sagittal view showing the epidural venous plexus you know, on the inside of the pedicles, uh, and, but it would be even heavier over the backs of the vertebral bodies and over the roof of the spinal canal. Okay, that said, now, what's the pathophysiology of neurogenic intermittent claudication? The leading theory, now there's a couple of them. Uh, they've been fighting back and forth for many decades. Uh, but this one makes the most sense, and this is the leading theory now. Uh, and the problem is with the flimsy epidural venous plexus. So, remember we have stenosis. These bones have grown like crazy here. Uh, ligamentum flavum is crushing all the epidural venous plexus. And therefore, it's causing a backup of blood. And what, what, what did I say dumps into the epidural venous plexus? The veins of the exiting nerve roots themselves. And so you're going to get a backup of blood, almost like when you get corpulmonale, when your right heart is failing, how you get a backup of blood and it causes the jugular veins to poke out and it causes the liver to be full of blood and can cause kaput medusa, those ugly snake-like vessels around your stomach. It can cause, it can back up blood and cause varicosities in the esophagus. It's almost the same story, but in this case, the blood backs up into the nerve root. So it swells up. It's almost like a compartment syndrome is a good way. I should have put that in there, but you might write that down. That's a compartment syndrome of the nerve root. And there's so much pressure in there that the blood actually gushes, leaks uh, out and uh, causes a nasty uh, effusion or nasty swelling edema within the nerve root and it kind of strangles the axons. It causes short circuits 
and it causes them to spontaneously fire. Those are called ectopic discharges. And if if one of your motor nerves ectopically discharges, if a bunch of them start to ectopically discharge, you get a short circuit and you, those muscles don't work and they start to hurt. If you get an ectopic discharge in your pain carrying nerve fibers, it signals your brain that you have pain coming from that area of the foot or the leg, wherever it came from. So that is the pathophysiology uh, of it. So everything I just said. And then well, why walking? Because when you walk, it increases the extension of the lumbar spine, which decreases the diameter of the canal. Uh, so basically, it's worsening the stenosis when you walk. Uh, and then your nerves are firing like crazy, right? Because the muscles are now using oxygen and they're increased signals. So the nerves are living tissue. They need increased blood supply, just like the muscles need increased blood supply. And they're not getting it because the epidural venous plexus is constricted. Now there's the other the other line the other theory on this is that it's the arteries the radicular arteries are compressed within the nerve roots and it all causes the same thing I mean you're getting an ischemia a compartment syndrome which results in an ischemia of the nerve root itself no matter which theory is correct the reason that the arteries probably aren't it which was very popular about a decade ago the arteries are just tough remember we saw them in gross uh, in lab uh, those things are tough they're strong uh, the the vessels are wimpy and collapsible, so they're much easier to compress, and that's been proven in animal research as well. So I'm not going to dig into it any uh, any deeper than that. We're not going to go crazy on that. All right, cauterquinus syndrome, switching gears. Uh, it's a rare but a very serious neurological uh, disorder. It was described way back by Mixer and Barr back in 34. Uh, classically, it's said to occur when the patient loses control of her, his or her bladder. Uh, but that's not exactly, in fact, that's not, I mean, that's kind of too late if that has happened. Uh, but if you see a new patient with any signs of cauterquine, it's a medical emergency, and if we drill that into your brains, got to refer them to the uh, nearest emergency room. If this is new, if they've had it for two years, then it's not a medical emergency. But if this has just started and they've never told anyone before, then you need to make the referral. And it typically comes from a severe compression. It's like central stenosis, but it's very, central stenosis starts very slowly and it's a gradual problem. This uh, cauterquinus syndrome occurs from a very uh, acute syndrome, um, usually a large central disc herniation like this one right here. So there's a huge fragment of disc herniation that's spit out of this disc. Uh, and this can cause real cauterquinus syndrome. It's a big trouble. Number one culprit, this one's on the test I'm pretty sure, is a large central disc herniation L4 and L5. And it's an injury. Now, there's a little debate on this, but most research says it's an injury to the S3 nerve root itself. Uh, and that will wipe out your voluntary control of your external urethral sphincter. You usually still are able to poop, right? Cauterquinus syndrome really refers to urine for the most part. Other potential causes, you could have spinal stenosis, but again, usually it's an acute thing. A spinal cord tumor, a hematoma could become acute and do it. Fracture can become acute. Affection, uh, rachnoiditis is usually more slow process. What are the warning signs? Bladder dysfunction. So especially uh, the big one that we got to watch out for is difficulty starting or initiating urination uh, combined with a saddle paresthesia in your if you were to sit on a bike seat your crotch area that's your that's your perineal region. Uh, so if you get numbness, tingling, itching, burning down there especially if you're having trouble starting urination. Uh, that's an emergency if that's just started and they need to go in and get a new MRI. Uh, sphincter dysfunction, so they don't have that wink sign. You're probably not gonna test that. Uh, perianal sensation loss, same thing. Uh, bilateral radicular pain is always a scary thing when they come in and they have Bilateral, why would that be a scary thing as I take some water here? Why would bilateral radicular pain below the knee be scary? In fact, you really need to question the patient if they have bilateral radicular pain about bowel and bladder. 
Well, what usually causes, what could cause bilateral radicular pain? A gigantic central herniation. And if it's enough to compress the exiting roots or traversing roots, it's big enough to get the S3 root. Bilateral motor sensory loss, same thing. Loss of deep tendon reflex, same thing. So there's two flavors of Cauda syndrome, incomplete and complete. Incomplete, still a medical emergency. In fact, it's usually more of a medical emergency because you might have a better chance of saving someone's bladder. Uh, the, ba the bladder uh, is in neurological distress. It's not permanently damaged or paralyzed yet. The signs are saddled, as I said. Hesitancy, can't start urination. Saddle anesthesia, sensory change. Uh, better bladder outcomes. If you catch this early, and if it is a huge central herniation or a hematoma, uh, if they get surgery quick, within 24 hours, there's a really good chance that you can save their bladder function and they won't have to use a catheter for the rest of their life. Uh, these are true medical emergencies. Complete cauda syndrome means the bladder's paralyzed. Your, your external urethral sphincter is gone. Remember we showed you those in, in gross one. Was it gross one? No, gross two. Showed you those. Matter of fact, I think I pinned That was one of my add-ins. I pinned it. I pinned it in some classes. It's very important because that's the one you can control when you got to go pee real bad and you have to hold it. That's the muscle you're using. You blow out your S3 root, you've just lost control to your external urethral sphincter. So you have no clue. You, if that's not working, just like your internal urethral sphincter is set, when the bladder gets so full, that one opens, the urine goes down, the urethra hits your, in, or your external urethral sphincter, and your brain goes, whoa, i got to go to the bathroom, but I can control that muscle. Now you'll have nothing. Once your internal urethral sphincter blows open, your external urethral sphincter will blow open. You'll have no clue. You'll just wet yourself. So you have to wear one of those little side bags. That's called overflow incontinence. Typically, let's see, some of the symptoms. You have a complete loss of sensation uh, in the perineal region. Timing of surgery is very controversial on this one. Some surgeons won't even get out of bed if it's, if it's been more than 24 hours because it doesn't seem to make a difference. Although for our purposes, it's still a medical emergency but it's probably too late if they've already got neurogenic bladder, a bladder that is leaking like that. Here's some studies on this. So surgical outcomes, not a whole lot of these. Here's a 215,000 published in Spine. Number one journal in the world, right? Or top three, arguably. Number one. Uh, studied 200 patients with bladder dysfunction who had caught as a syndrome secondary to a large disc herniation, mainly at L4. And about equal, right? L4 and L5 herniations. And the patients who had the incomplete cauda syndrome with the numbness and the hesitancy, the ones we got to watch out for, they did significantly better with regard to having to catheterize compared to the patients who already had leakage and spillage and they, they already had neurogenic bladder. And it didn't matter. These patients, if you could do surgery within 24 hours, Less of them had to use a catheter in the long run. Uh, but these people who already had severe neurogenic bladder, didn't matter if you did the surgery 72 hours or even longer, the damage was already done. Sciatica, you guys are pretty good at this already. Sciatica is a term used to describe a burning, radiating pain. Sometimes electric light travels from the butt down the thigh, past the knee into the foot. Uh, limited to the L4, L5, and S1 dermatome. Why is sciatica limited to the L4, 5, and S1 dermatome? As I take water. Yeah, those are the nerve roots that make up the sciatic nerve. Hence sciatica. That's why it's not really the greatest term in the world. A better term is radicular pain. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> radicular pain. Because then you can describe uh, you can describe everything. It can be pain radiating to the to the groin an L1 L2 problem or the anterior thigh an L3 problem or algia paresthetica. So I like radicular pain much better than sciatica. And I know I've talked about this over the course over the um, course, but we're really going to drill this home now. 
Radicular pain is an adjective that describes a radiating pain that is semi-dermatonal-like. It doesn't have to be, but it just describes a radiating pain down the leg. Uh, and it occurs most likely because the exiting and or traversing nerve roots become irritated uh, at or near the disc level which uh, is being irritated. And there's ectopic discharge there. And so this ectopic discharge, if a disc herniation is pressing on an exiting or traversing nerve root, it's causing an inflammation of that nerve root, and it's causing a short circuit in the wire, so to speak. And it causes them to spontaneously fire action potentials. That's an S ectopic discharge. And if that happens to be the S1 nerve root, which usually supplies the outside of the foot, the irritation at the disc level sends a signal that the foot is burning to the brain. Is really the side of your foot is not burning, but your brain doesn't know the difference. Okay, uh, and this is very important right here. So, in order for you to have radicular pain, typically, you have to have a combination of two things. There has to be a compression of that nerve root by the disc herniation or or degenerative spondylolisthesis or bone spur, but that's not enough. Compression alone won't typically cause radicular pain. Now, if an inflammation starts at the site of compression, that's the one-two punch that causes the sciatica, that causes the radicular pain. That's very important for you to understand that. I should put another star right there. There's not half for radicular pain, you don't have to have motor or sensory loss on examination. So a patient can still have radicular pain and you do the neurological examination, it's normal. They still have radicular pain, but they don't have radiculopathy. In order to have radiculopathy, you have to have positive neurological examination. I think we'll get to that in a minute. 85% percent of the uh, cases, radicular pain is associated with problem with the intervertebral disc. So patients with radicular pain almost always or they typically have a disc herniation or a leaking annular tear. Rarely, radicular pain could be caused from metastatic disease. You could get cancer cells inside the nerve root through the radicular arteries uh, or some other pathology, an infection or something. Now, radiculopathy, what is that? That means that the axons in and around the disc level whether it be motor, sensory, or nociceptive, or proprioceptive, uh, they become injured uh, to the point, inflamed and compressed usually, where they spontaneously fire, they're short-circuiting. And if it's a, if it's a nociceptor short-circuiting, it's gonna signal pain. If it's a motor nerve, it's gonna cause dysfunction to those fascicles that it's connected to. If it's a bunch of them, you're gonna have weakness in that muscle. Okay, so cause well area degeneration can occur. I mean, you guys have had that. I won't get into that. Um, so radiculopathy should not be used to describe lower extremity pain. Radiculopathy is not an adjective. When you say, or when you're presenting to me, and you say a patient in room two has uh, radiculopathy down the right leg, it passes the knee, I probably will fire you because that's ridiculous. You will say, after my neurological evaluation, I found sensory loss uh, in the outside of the foot, and they had weak gastroc power, uh, so I think they have a radiculopathy of the S1 nerve root. That's a radiculopathy is a diagnosis. This is not an adjective. Got it? What is radiculopathy? We talked about this already. Uh, so radiculopathy is present. Uh, radiculopathy presents with the symptoms of radicular pain. So some patients with radicular pain have radiculopathy. Some patients with radicular pain don't have radiculopathy. the The gold standard way to diagnose radiculopathy is by running a uh, EMG NCV study, electromyography, and nerve conduction velocity test. Uh, and remember, these are worthless. They used to, chiropractors used to do this. Not, I don't know if they hope they still don't do it, but they do NCV studies uh, with just mapping the nerve conduction speed, worthless for making the diagnosis of radiculopathy without 
EMG. In fact, we could even do without this. EMG is the key component, and that's where you stick a needle in the muscle uh, and you sense whether what type of electrical signal that muscle is getting. If there is damage to the axon uh, at the disc level, that muscle remember I said it's short-circuiting, that muscle will detect, that needle will detect within the muscle these weird little quivering, uh, these F waves or these fibs or, you know, I'm not going to go down that path. You probably had that in neurology already, um, but uh, that's what it is. So, so, but to make the diagnosis, all you need is, you if you, if you have uh, EMG and CV findings great, but for our, I mean, we don't do this. So if you if you're in your office and you find decrease in reflex, motor weakness, or sensor change, that's enough to make the diagnosis of radiculopathy. You know, and you're saying, well, why? How? Who cares? Just you know, it's, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Uh, for one, when reviewers are looking at your work and thinking about authorizing more treatment, if you have a diagnosis of radiculopathy, that's a much more serious problem, and they may be apt to give you more treatments. I doubt it, but, uh, I mean, logically, you could make an argument that this is a more complicated case. Uh, whether if you just have radicular pain with a normal neurological evaluation, then they would expect your patient to get better. So it's important to use this term if it's present. We said this, nerve root compression, 85% of the time, it's a herniation. Central stenosis can do it. Lateral stenosis can do it. Uh, degeneration, remember, a degenerative spondylolisthesis can slip forward, and the superarticular process can jam right into the lateral recess. And the beak of an isthmic spondylolisthesis can shish kebab the nerve going around the pedicle. Uh, so both types of spinal lysis can cause nerve root compression. Scoliosis, especially if the patient's older, especially if they have osteoporosis, at the that would be the concavity of the curve. You can get a collapse of the neural foramen uh, because of the unequal pressure, and that can cause radicular pain as the IVF collapses. It's called a degenerative collapse. Synovial cysts can do it. We talked about those already. You can rarely get a piriformis syndrome. It's not nearly as prevalent as uh, some instructors will teach you. Uh, and some medical companies, uh, they go overboard. It seems like every other decade or so this pops up. Prevalence is probably 2%. So it doesn't happen uh, at the most, 10%. It doesn't happen that much, but it could. So you could get an irritation of, because remember, the sciatic nerve passes right under the piriformis. So it's possible. You could order a functional MRI. We're not going to have time to talk about the sciatic patients, the real radiculopathy patients who have a normal, EM, a normal MRI. Uh, but then you start need to start looking at piriformis syndrome, far-out syndrome, uh, if they have transitional segment, they could be in trouble, or some troubles with that. Um, okay, so piriformis syndrome, tumor and infection, vertebral body or fracture, if there was trauma. The, there's a chemical radicular pain. Now, there's not a ton of research, but there's definitely some research on it. And the theory is that an, a full thickness annular tear, grade 4 or grade 5 annular tear that's leaking, can leak cytokines out the back of the disc, and they can soak into the nerve root that's right there, the exiting or the traversing. And it can induce a real uh, inflammatory uh, radiculopathy. And it happens all the time. In fact, it happened to me because I had an L5 herniation compressing the S1 nerve root. My, I had a huge annular tear at L4, L5, which... Uh, was must have been leaking because when I did my EMG, it was positive for L4, L5, and S1 radiculopathy. And so there is research on it. It's rare. I see it probably every third month in my, my coaching. Uh, but it can happen. So that's always a possible explanation for it. Tumor necrosis factor alpha is the ringleader of the pro-inflammatory cytokine that soaks into the nerve root and causes an inflammation without compression. Okay, everything I said here. That's why these anti-tumor necrosis factor inhibitors are still a very hot area of research, trying to find a, something to 
in, in, improve the outcomes of epidural steroid injections. Approximately 5% of all humans uh, will have sciatica at least once in their life. And if you've ever had it, most of you have never had it. It's, it you, you can't understand it unless you've had it. It's a horrible, horrible pain, like your whole leg has been sunburned and it just doesn't go away. 5% of humans have that. Typically strikes in the 40s. Weird. If you look at all the research papers, the average age is like 44. It's just strange. 40s is a really rough time for sciatica. First attack of sciatica will typically completely heal up in 60 to 80 uh, percent. As long as that patient wasn't hospitalized. Uh, if the patient was hospitalized, it's really bad. We'll see a study on that. I don't know if I put that new study in or not. But so 20 to 40 percent, they never fully recover. That's a lot of people not recovering from sciatica. And uh, about half of those people will have a lifelong flare-ups and real battles with radicular pain. Um, severe sciatica, which requires hospitalization, it should be bolded, typically has a really poor prognosis. So greater than 70% of patients hospitalized for severe sciatica will continue to suffer debilitating sciatica even 12 months after conservative care. 70% or more. So it's a big, sciatica is a big problem. It's like asthma. You're, you're kind of in the club. Risk factors for the development of disc herniation related radiculopathy. Bad genetics. Surprisingly, there's not a whole lot of research on genetics on this. But occupation is a big one. Heavy manual labor definitely increases the chances of blowing your disc and having sciatica. And strangely, this is from a two, 1995 study that won the Volvo Award. Was it B Bailey? I think a Bailey or Beetle or Bailey study. Uh, it's a Volvo Award winning study though. Surprisingly, they found that office workers who sat on their butts most of the day and truck drivers who didn't get out of the cab, they had just as high of rate of herniation uh, induced radicular pain as heavy ship workers or, or dock workers did. So make sure you get those stand-up desks at work, which are becoming more common. Best occupations are those that require frequent position changes like mine. I can sit up, I can sit down. Uh, those, that's the way to go. Moderate physical activity. Treatment for sciatica, who's this? As I take some water. That's probably the best treatment for sciatica right there. Mother Nature, passage of time. Um, there's no, there's no evidence. There's no solid medical evidence, research evidence that anything can help sciatica, uh, other than discectomy. There's some anecdotal stuff, but there's not a single chiropractic research paper, acupuncture research paper, medication research paper that shows that any of that treatment does anything for sciatica. Uh, it's mother nature will do just as good with sciatica. And she'll do as good as sciatica in most people, uh, but it, she's very slow is the problem. The I don't know if I have this in here, it's on my website, the Weber study of the 80s. Uh, it took, I think it was about 50 people. They, the 100 patients, they all needed surgery. They It wasn't emergency surgery, but they all needed surgery. They randomized 50 into a conservative care group. 50 had the surgery. They followed them for 10 years. Amazingly, they had over a 90% uh, retention. So we know what happened to them all uh, in 10 years. And the ones who had surgery were much better at a year, much happier in general. Uh, and that held all the way through 10 years. The ones who didn't have surgery, surgery were miserable at one year. They're miserable at three years. But by five years, somewhere between three and five years, they finally got better and they caught up with the patients who didn't, uh, with the patients who had the surgery. And that held all the way to the end. And that sports study shows the same thing. The modern studies show the same thing. So the body has incredible healing powers. It's just a little slow sometimes. So anecdotally, there are some things we can try that make sense that maybe will help Mother Nature. Flexion distraction like Cox or Leander uh, tables might help. Uh, I think those are probably just as effective, if not more, than those very, very expensive Vax-D and DRX-9000. Um, there's no evidence that, show, that shows they work. 
uh, any better than flexion distraction. And there's no evidence that shows either of those really works any better than Mother Nature, any creditable randomized controlled trials. So flexion distraction treatment. If you want to use a DRX 9000, that's fine as well. Just be careful. I've seen discs blown out by those things. And I've seen discs blown out by Cox flexion distraction as well. So you have to be very careful and start very slowly. Uh, one thing's for sure, exercise is great. Get them walking over flat ground slowly every day. Not crazy like 10 miles, like maybe 20 minutes to start out. Uh, swimming flat with a mask and snorkel so they don't have to uh, twist their back is fantastic. Anything to get their heart rate up without flaring themselves up is what you want to do with them. Don't stretch them. Right? If they have Wallerian degeneration and that nerve is trying to heal, you don't want to stretch a nerve that's trying to heal. That will, in my opinion, slow the healing down. So I'm not a fan of stretching when someone has really radiculopathy. And don't want them laying around in bed. Maybe the first day or two when they're so acute they can't move, but then they got to get up, get them back to work, uh, get them Get them off their butts, up and down, changing positions. Because that epidural venous plexus will start, if you're laying there on your back, it's going to start filling up with blood. And that blood's going to back up into the nerve roots, and it's going to increase the tension, like a compartment syndrome in the nerve root that's already compressed and irritated. So get them moving. Uh, epidural steroid injections. I think these are actually a good thing. Now, there's some risk, and they will always go over those risks with you. Uh, and the research says that they don't do any good in the long run, but I have a problem with that research. And the problem is they let anybody into those studies. I think if you would get an epidural steroid injection within the first month and then follow that group of patients uh, for a couple years, I bet you they would do better, have less residual damage than people who... Uh, who didn't have any epidural steroid at all. Uh, and no one's ever done, to my knowledge, I've never seen a study like that, surprisingly, and that needs to be done. But they definitely, I've had probably three or four of those things. And when the pain is unbearable, uh, it can definitely give you some temporary relief and get you over the hump uh, where Mother Nature can get a chance uh, to make you feel, you know, kind of get you, decrease the pain a little bit. So they're definitely worth it, in my opinion, if they're done, always done under fluoroscopic guidance by a certified uh, pain management rehabilitation doctor. They're usually anesthesiologists. Uh, decompression surgery, microdiscectomy, foraminotomy, latimonotomy, interbody fusion. That's the number one treatment that gets patients better, but there's a bunch of caveats with that. The patient has to be a perfect candidate. They should have a positive straight leg raise test. They should be within the first four months of this sciatica. They shouldn't be over a year for sure. I, that's part of the problem with my surgery. Nobody told me. I was a year and a half, and the chances of it working at that time are not very good. Uh, there's a bunch of experimental procedures that try to decrease the herniation from inside out. Nucleopasty, selective endoscopic discectomy, uh, IDAT, endoscopic discectomy, all the laser treatments. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. Insurance usually doesn't pay for some, most of it, and it's not supported research, and I don't recommend going down that road. Traditional microdiscectomy is the way uh, to go with loops uh, or the magnifying goggles. Disc herniations is kind of a fun part here. Uh, by far, again, the most common cause of radicular pain, patients over 65, 85% of the time, right? Very common. Nucleus pulposus has moved out of the disc through the annular tear and it's compressing, irritating the nerve roots. Here's a whopper right here in one of my old clients. Uh, big disc herniation. And these are incredibly, ended up having surgery. These are incredibly, incredibly painful. If they break off and go in this cubby hole, uh, sometimes you can avoid surgery. If they sequester, it's sometimes better. But when they stay like that, they're big trouble. They can cause cauterquinus syndrome too. Remember, I've talked about this before. Disc herniation is the parent category, and it has three children underneath or subcategories. First is a disc protrusion, aka subligamentous herniation, contained disc herniation. It's a small herniation, two, three, maybe five millimeters in size. Uh, it doesn't on the sagittal view, it doesn't typically rise above the vertebral end plate. 
uh, of either level or go below of the bottom member of the motion segment. Uh, it's typically contained by the posterior longitudinal ligament. That's really hard to see on MRI sometimes. And it's typically just a small little thing. It has a broad base, not a narrow base. And yes, everything I said there. The next category is a disc extrusion, also called a non... Uh, these should be stars by all this. A non-contained disc herniation, transligamentous herniations, or AKA. Some moderately large herniation, greater than four millimeter, or greater than five millimeters. So it's, you know, five is kind of the in-between spot. So six, seven, eight millimeters is usually an extrusion. It usually goes above or below the vertebral end plates. Uh, it usually breaks the longitud posterior longitudinal ligament. It also has the best chance of being reabsorbed by the body, right? Macrophage attack can gobble this thing up really fast. We'll see an example here uh, in a little bit of this. Uh, protrusions, no. The body can't see them as well, and typically they are not reabsorbed. These have a more narrow base, uh, and they dip above and below the plane of the motion segment end plates. Sequestration means the disc is completely broken loose. It's never completely broken loose, though. There's always some little attachments, uh, some connections floating around. And let's see. So herniation can be classified by locations. I think we did this the first week, but it's so important. I'm bringing it back. Central herniation is right in the central zone. Paracentral means this is the most common, should have put a star by this one, paracentral uh, occurs in the lateral recess uh, because it goes to the left or the right of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Foraminal disc herniation uh, it means it's inside the neural foramen or IVF. And far lateral disc herniation means it's, it's occurred outside of the IVF. Oftentimes these two go to, oftentimes foraminal herniations will be a little bit in the foramen. I'm sorry, oftentimes far lateral herniations will be in the uh, foramen as well. Here's the zones again. This is back on the test again. Central, paracentral zone or the lateral recess. The, don't forget this, a lot of you miss this. This, I'm seeing this, I used to see it in Europe, but I'm seeing it more in this country. Subarticular zone is an AKA for the foraminal zone. It's in the neural foramen. I don't know why they call it subarticular, but I've seen that more and more. Uh, extra foraminal zone is out here, far lateral zone. And you can see, you should know these two, right? There's the traversing. If this is L4, here's the L5 traversing roots. Here's the S1 traversing route. So you can see motor and a sensory route. Uh, and here is the exiting. If this is L4, this is the exiting L4 route here. That's the traversing L5 route. Yeah, that's S1 route. S2 is it. S3 you can't see. All right, let's, let's test your knowledge here. Describe the herniation while I take some water. Well, I know it's a herniation, I hear you, but I want to know what type of herniation it is. Which category? Well, this one's easy. It's going below, the, here's the vertebral end plate. Definitely going below the vertebral end plate. So that's, a, that's an extrusion. And there's a picture there. Remember, here's the cut line. Whatever you, it's like you erase what's above the cut line. There it is right there. Okay, everything I said right there. Let's do another one. Oh, that's definitely an extrusion, right? Look at it. It's even different colored. So it almost looks like a sequestration in this view. But from, from the pictures you have here, uh, you just say it's an extrusion. I can't tell for sure if it's fragmented. Notice the different colors, though. See, there's the body of the disc. It's darker. That's not going to reabsorb. But this stuff that's light here, no research on this, but... Many times I've had clients have an initial MRI like this and they come back later and this is all gone. That's a good sign for natural healing there if they can stand it. Everything I said, what about this one? I see some of you going, what's going on here? Well, what's this? That's a sequestered fragment. So the L3 disc has spit out a big chunk Let's put a cut right through it and see what it looks like. It's a whopper. So that's a disc sequestration or sequestered fragment. Even though it's still attached to the disc, but look, there's a color change again. It's lighter than disc material. That's a good sign. 
probably an inflammation in there, which bodes well for natural reabsorption. What's this one? Well, I don't see anything here. There's the lateral recesses look good. There's the traversing roots. Oh, there's a mountain peak there. We don't see that on the other side, right? So that's a really broad base. That's a really big one. So that's a disc extrusion. That's that's probably six, seven millimeters. And notice the cut line's going right through it. So whatever we see that cut line going through is what, that's the slice we see over here. Okay, everything I said. Sorry for the sniffles. I'm making it. I almost made it through this. It's Saturday. Usually I wanted to do this on Friday, but I just didn't feel good enough to do it yesterday. What's this one? Whoa, look at that. There's a rare central herniation. It's ripped right through the posterior longitudinal ligament. And I would say, boy, it looks just too big. I would. It's not going above or below the end plates. Uh, that's got to be, what, six, seven millimeters? Let's see if I measured it. Yep, so it's still an extrusion. It's getting closer to protrusion, but it's still, there's a protrusion probably down there. Um, but that's, yeah, it's still a small extrusion. How about this one? Oh, I know you got this one now. This is much smaller than the ones, and you'll see a lot of these. These do terrible with, these are the worst to have. This is the kind I had, and the research supports that. These do terrible with surgery. Uh, very unlikely a discectomy will help these. Um, it's both of these are, well, that, this one's a little bigger here, but this is a cut through the L4 disc. Uh, so that's got to be, what, about five, four or five millimeters. Let's see, I must have measured it. Yeah, four to five millimeter central protrusion, so that's a disc protrusion. See how broad based it is? It's got a really broad base, and it's small. And it's central. Oh, some fun facts. Herniations occur in the paracentral zone most of the time. They compress the traversing, not the exiting root. That'll be on your test again. Uh, they have the best, or the best surgical prognosis is with extrusions and sequestrations. Anything greater than six millimeters or so. Worse for, I already said that, worse for small contained herniations. Uh, contraindicated for disc bulge. I thought no one in the right mind would do that, but a couple months ago I had a client, not from this country, uh, but they, he was miserable, and I looked at his pre-MRI, and all he had was a bulge, and the surgeon tried to piece the entire bulge on both sides, and it was a disaster. So he ended up having fusion, and I haven't heard back from him, which probably is not a good sign. Um, so never allow for, or always get a second opinion with uh, a disc bulge you don't do it's it, if they have discogenic pain then you need a fusion not a, not a discectomy these lateral disc herniations i'm not going to get too much into this but you have to use a transframinal approach with these things so they're not the success rate of lateral disc herniations the discectomy success is not nearly as good as the normal uh, paracentral type herniations there's just how the paracentral herniation occurs. There's the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's really hard to get through. It's hard to rip that thing. So they usually score it out uh, to the left or right in the paracentral zone. I can't see my slide numbers. Did I not put slide numbers on here? That's never good. Um, What's the slide? Let's see. Paracentral herniations are almost always compress the traversing nerve root. So here's a paracentral. Remember the nerve traversing root is it's still inside. It's not shown here. But if it's big enough, it can compress the her here's paracentral zone. It's here. If it's big enough, it can compress both the exiting and traversing root. Symptomatic herniations may cause only radicular pain could cause a combination of radicular pain and low back pain, or only low back pain. I know what I was going to do here, and I forgot. So you guys can write this in. Why does a disc herniation, we know why it causes leg pain, because it interferes, it irritates the traverse or exiting root. Why does it cause low back pain? Well, 
it starts out as a what? A full thickness annular tear. So the annular tear rips right through the posterior quarter of the disc or third of the disc, and that's where the sinovertebral nerves are. So you get a biochemical and a pressure irritation of the sinovertebral nerves. Sinovertebral nerves are also on the anterior portion of the thecal sac as well. So you can get back pain from both of those mechanisms. Microdiscectomy, again, is only designed for the treatment of disc herniations, protrusions, and extrusions, really. And it's designed to treat radicular pain. It doesn't do very good for low back pain. If someone's major complaint is low back pain uh, and they have a discectomy, at best, 50-50 chance, that's anecdotal. There's no research on that, but I know several spine surgeons, and they both independently always pick their brain on that question. They both always shake their heads. 50-50 chance it'll help their low back pain. Surgeons are generally very optimistic, so in reality, it's probably about a 40% chance it's going to help their low back pain. Not to say it won't. Some people it does, but discectomy is designed for the treatment of radicular pain, not low back pain. Inner body fusion is designed for the treatment of low back pain. Gold standard treatment for disc herniation related radicular pain, which was a fractured conservative care and epidural steroid shots, is a microdiscectomy. More fun facts disc herniation. Here's some words for a herniated nucleus pulposus, disc prolapse, more of a European term, HNP, slipped disc, absolutely terrible term. Gotta get, don't ever use that term or lumbago. Uh, if you use that term, you think of me haunting you uh, in your practice. Don't use those terms. They're terrible terms, a slip disc. Use the proper terminology. Approximately 2% of humans with low back pain, leg pain, will necessitate spine surgery. So most of the patients who come into your practice with leg pain uh, and back pain, only 2% of them are going to go actually end up having surgery. So the chances are good you and Mother Nature can get the job done. Uh, 1%, under 1% of the general population prevalence or the incidence of spine surgery is under 1%. Now, if you have a spondylolisthesis, rises to 10%, 10, over 10 times normal. I think we talked about that in that section of the class. Three strikes and you're out. If a herniation reoccurs for a third time at the same level, the next, the surgeon's not going to want to do another discectomy because the chances are really, really high that it's going to herniate again. I had a patient just like that uh, not too long ago, or a client, can't call them patients. Uh, I had a client not too long ago who was on his fourth strike, and he, he shopped and shopped, and he finally found a surgeon who would try it for the fourth time. All the other ones, there's like five other ones who said, no, you need a fusion. And I tried to tell him it's you know it's going to reherniate again. You need to prepare, but I don't think he listened to me. So I don't know what happened to him, but it's probably not a good thing. So three strikes and you're out. Uh, slip disc again. Don't use that term. It makes you sound. It just doesn't make you sound good. You have herniated disc. You don't have to get into a protrusion or extrusion or sequestration if you want. I always told my patients the truth exactly what they had. Uh, and never use the term disc bulge to describe a disc herniation. A bulge is a general outpouching of the entire posterior region of the disc. Herniation is a focal bump on a log. It's a, a focal outpouching of a, just a small region of the posterior disc. Don't mix those terms up. I won't get into the lawyer stuff, but defense attorneys always call herniations bulges. Applicant attorneys always call bulges herniations. So the legal community knows these terms, so be very specific. In order to make the diagnosis of disc herniated related radicular pain, must, patient must have the following symptoms. So they have to have radiating lower extremity pain, especially usually passes the knee, it's usually confined to close to a dermatone. They should have an orthopedic test, a straight leg raise, or a well leg raise test. Nobody really does slump. It's just too complicated of a test, and it pisses off the patient. It usually hurts them. <coughs> I'm not a fan of that test. <clears throat> and now the new research says that the well leg raise test has the highest sensitivity. 
Uh, I'm sorry, high specificity anyway. Anyway, uh, neurological testing, positive uh, motor, te there should be a positive motor sensory examination or reflex testing. Uh, and then if you have an EMG, great. So you don't make the, di uh, the diagnosis of herniation. Um, I mean, you really need to have an MRI to make the diagnosis of herniation, right? Anyway, I have to look at that slide next quarter. But the real way you make the diagnosis is this thing. Closed, not an open tube. Don't ever get one of those standing open. Those things are terrible. Always get a three Tesla closed tube MRI. And make sure they don't have the patient in there 15 minutes. All these three Tesla machines. I was seeing beautiful, beautiful images. And now I'm seeing crummy images again. And I come to find out they're using, I confirmed this with the owner of an MRI center I know. And what they're doing is they're using that powerful magnet to decrease the time. So instead of getting beautiful images with a 45-minute exam, I'm getting crappy images, and they're doing a 15, 20-minute exam, cramming more patients in their tube. So you got to be careful of that. Make sure you get really nice images. And remember, too, about MRI, there's about a 30% false positive rate. Uh, for protrusion, not for extrusion, and not for sequestration. But for disc protrusion, there's a 30% false positive rate. So just because there's a herniation, a, a protrusion doesn't always mean it's symptomatic. But always order an MRI if the patient has leg pain greater than back pain, and if there's positive neurological findings. You need to see what you're doing down there. What kind do you order? Uh, three Tesla machine. I just went over this takes 45 to 60 minutes it should take not 15 uh, make sure the technician makes the cuts down the plane of the disc don't let them get lazy and just run a stack series all the way down and it gets really hard to look at the images like that unless you look at them all the time and uh, the cut should be three millimeters on the sa on the axials and four millimeters on the saginals. They definitely should be not five millimeters. You can jump right over someone's disc at five millimeters. I've seen more and more of that. So three millimeters, four millimeters. I prefer two millimeter cuts, three millimeter cuts. Uh, some of the best MRIs in the world, uh, believe it or not, have come out of China. I've seen they they take incredible pride in their work of the patients or the clients I've had from China, their MRIs are incredible. Germany and India also has very, very good quality MRIs. This country, I don't know sometimes. Anyway, you can tell, oh, there's slide 127. Oh, I'm getting a little cuckoo, as you probably are too. Never order an open MRI unless the patient's called to phobic. They're like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 Tesla. They're crap. Okay, here's a, did this 2016, I pulled up all the high quality MRI studies where they looked at normal patient, or normal patients without low back pain to see what the prevalence of disc pathology is. So disc bulges, I mean, everybody's got disc bulges. Disc protrusions, by my definitions, 20% uh, in the boat, in the famous Jensen study, they're about 30%. Uh, Boos, which was construction workers, 63%. This is kind of an anomaly, but I did want to put it in there. Uh, so 63%. But that was not a normal people walking down the street. Those were all construction heavy workers. And then, so the average comes out to 29%. Uh, disc extrusions, uh, none, or they didn't look at those in uh, Bowdoin. Jensen, 1%. Uh, and disc sequestrations, uh, you just don't see those, period. Uh, so you, you can see ex small ex extrusions occasionally in normal people, but not usually, 9%. All right. Degenerative disc disease, though, is, is uh, very common. I guess I didn't put that category in there. Can disc herniations call, uh, heal naturally? Uh, yeah, 15 patients. Here's a study. We all know this. There's lots of studies on this. Here's a recent one, JBGS, which is a really impressive journal. Followed 15 patients with massive disc herniations for two years. These were huge. They were all recommended to have emergency surgery, and they didn't have 
They didn't have insurance. And so the deal was, we'll treat you conservatively, but you have to let us follow you. That's what they did. At two years, they repeated the MRI for these patients for free as part of the study. Uh, and 100% of the herniations were reabsorbed by an average of 80%. Let me say that again. The disc herniations went away by 80% in size uh, by two years. Uh, without any, they didn't have any chiropractic care. They had some medication and exercise, and that was it. So they, uh, but unfortunately, this is well known too, just because the herniation disappears, sometimes people, sometimes the symptoms go away, but sometimes the symptoms are just as bad. So that's why a lot of times you don't have time, if you have a surgical sized lesion, you don't have time to wait around that long to see if they disappear. The damage will be done. Here's another study. Um, CO followed 43 patients who had fairly big herniations for six months while they were treated conservatively. Six month follow up demonstrated 38% of the group had bigger herniations in this one. But of the really big herniations in this group, 88% of them significantly decreased in size. The smaller contained herniations didn't do anything. Um, so those are, those are pesky, those are troublemakers. And again, as we already know, the volume changed. So whether the herniation got bigger or smaller, it was not related to the clinical improvement. So there was no, they were all over the map with that regard. Some got worse, yet their herniations decreased in size. Some had improvement, yet the herniations increased in size. There's a lot we don't understand yet. I think this is my last case because my voice is about gone. Montana Jack, 73-year-old patient, retired, he had a severe attack of low back pain and bilateral leg pain or leg numbness on a fishing trip. The ER doctors diagnosed the sprain, gave the patient a walker, ordered physical therapy, treated with physical therapists, went to a chiropractor. All this treatment failed. Uh, they ordered, I think it was a chiropractor ordered the MRI. Um, and then the orthopedic sign surgeon did an evaluation. So at that evaluation from those records, he had a diminished left grade and right patella reflex, weakness of both quadriceps, negative straight leg raise. He recommended emergency surgery based on this, uh, this MRI. Patient didn't know what to do, so he consulted with me on this. So not, I mean, he had a nasty looking herniation, as we'll see. But on the Oswestry, he was only a 25. And what did I teach you guys about Oswestry and disc herniations? The average outcome of a discectomy is about 17, 18%. So it's, I like my, pay, my clients over, over 50 before they have a surgery. 25%, it's going to get better. It's going to get down to an average discectomy outcome without the discectomy. So I didn't recommend that. I had him stop the chiropractic and physical therapy. They were manipulating him. Um, so I just did him home exercises and walk, and that's it. So he was still having 410 bilateral leg pain, but, weakness, but his weakness was greatly improved at the time. So one of the, remember the emergency surgery things, the indications for emergency surgery are progressive loss of motor dysfunction, bowel or bladder symptoms, or severe unrelenting pain. He didn't have any of those things. So he wasn't an absolute surgical candidate. Here's his MRI from 6-15-15. A rare T2 and L2 disc herniation. And here's one of the as examples. If you look, now it's a huge extrusion, right? Look at it. But you can see the body of the herniation right here. See the different colors? So based on my experience that's a good indication that that's going to be reabsorbed by the body here's the axial view really big extrusion here crushing the thecal sac exiting uh, traversing roots uh, smashed here so but he wasn't doing that bad so he didn't have the surgery there's a blow up of it again or blow up so to seven measured seven by 21 uh, and that's a dangerous area to have surgery by the way because the, the conus medullaris is right in this region so it can be a, kind of a dicey area all right so i recommended no surgery because of everything i just told you 
And there's the indications, right, that I just told you. Make sure you know those. That's a test question. Second coaching. So I saw him about a year later. Uh, just spoke with a patient again. He's doing much better. He's back to fishing three to four times a week. Minimal back pain. Uh, he had a little loss of proprioception. Got a little wobbly while walking down the streams, hitting those rocks. A little bit of still mild quadricep weef reflex or weakness in the quads. And he wanted to know if he should have the surgery still for this. Um, and you can guess my answers. Os Westry was even lower. I don't know if I put it down. I think it was down to the 10 or something like that. But he had been doing nothing except the activities, daily living. My, some of my, I didn't even tell him to do this. He's been doing some of the core strengthening on my web page. And he was walking flat 20, 60 minutes per day. He got a new MRI, and we went over the new MRI. And you can already see. What do you see as I take my last sip of water here? I don't see anything. Where'd it go? I see just a little sign of little inflammation in there, maybe a little annular tear. It's gone. That's a reabsorbed disc herniation. Gone. No chiropractic care, no physical therapy, just Mother Nature. Here's a here's a before and after. 615, these are almost a year apart. So here's the huge uh, extrusion. And here's the one year after. Pretty amazing, huh? So, reabsorbed disc extrusion, minimal disability, warned him about being careful. There's a risk of reherniation. Uh, should avoid lifting weights greater than 30, 45 pounds. These are limitations you can give your patients. They're pretty much been around forever. No heavy pushing, pulling things, no repetitive bending, twisting, stooping at the waist, no prolonged sitting. And thank your lucky stars. Keep fishing. Enjoy your retirement. So very uh, happy uh, older retiree. That's a fish. Real picture of him. Oh, no, that's not a real picture of him, I don't think. Uh, birth of a herniation. There's a whopper. Another whopper there. I think we... You I mean, here's the parts. You guys already know all these parts. But here's a cartoon. So this is a disc bulge. The entire back of the spinal uh, the entire back of the disc is bulged out that remember we get three grades of tears grade one grade two grade three is the full thickness tear that grade four is leaking grade five is a ship anchor there's a ship anchor then you get a small protrusion then you rip the posterior longitudinal ligament now we have an extruded disc compressing this one's so big it's compressing the exiting and traversing roots and then you get a breaking loose of that disc, and that's a, that's a sequestration. All right, we are done. I will see you on Thursday for your midterm. I'm thinking it'll be very similar to the, I'm sorry, I'll see you Thursday for the final. It'll be very similar to the midterm, and nice talking to you. See you later.